Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, LFAI uh, project mini summit. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a few presentations with a number of speakers touching on several areas uh, as they relate to LFAI. Um, this uh, presentation right now was scheduled to be uh, presented by my colleague, uh, Jacqueline Sarafin, who is unfortunately unable to attend uh, the presentation. So uh, I am Ibrahim Haddad, I'm the Executive Director of LFAI, and I'll be walking you through the LFAI uh, presentation. Um, so this is uh, about 15 to 20 minutes. I will cover um, some basics on LFAI, our progress so far, how to get involved and various updates across uh, the various work uh, we have been doing. Um, as you may be aware, LFAI was established in um, 2018, so we're about two and a half years almost uh, as an umbrella foundation under the Linux Foundation. And uh, if you think of the LF Linux Foundation, it's our parent foundation. And under the LF, there are a number of umbrella foundations. There's LFAI, we focus on open source AI. Uh, there are CNCF, focuses on open source uh, cloud native. There are Hyperledger, LF Edge, LF networking, and so on. And we all share the same goal of advancing open source technical projects and innovation, each in their specific domains. So from that perspective, in LFAI, we focus on increasing collaboration and advancing innovation and development in open source projects uh, in the AI space that covers machine learning, deep learning, NLP, uh, notebooks, data, models, and many other subcategories and edX. And I will touch on this a little uh, in a following slide. Uh, so this is one of my favorite slides that I use in almost all of my presentations talking about LFAI. And it illustrates basically the very growing ecosystem of open source AI. This is the LFAI landscape, which covers all uh, the top tier projects categorized in the different categories. Uh, and this is actually an interactive landscape. So if you visit the website, HTTPS um, column forward forward slash uh, landscape dot LFAI dot foundation, you'll be able to actually click on each of these projects and get a lot of information from them. Uh, and the reason I would like to cover this uh, and I cover that uh, landscape in all of my presentation is that it gives us a lot of indications uh, on the different categories in the open source AI space. So you can see, I think we have nine or 10 different categories. And then we have subcategories inside each of these major categories. And then the number of projects that are kind of what, what we consider top tier projects uh, within each of these subcategories. And you can see it's a very thriving ecosystem uh, with a lot of projects. Uh, basically these projects, I think we have a little around 250 projects right now in the landscape. Uh, with 30,000 plus developer actively contributing to this project um, and hundreds of millions of lines of code. Uh, so the space, the open source AI space is extremely healthy, uh, growing and on a weekly basis, we're adding projects into the landscape. So please visit it and have a look. Um, so having looked at the landscape, one of the challenges that we notice in general in the open source AI uh, ecosystem uh, is uh, related to fragmentation. So you can see a lot of projects that have um, a lot of efforts ongoing, uh, somewhat replicating efforts, basically. There's a lack of integration across a lot of these projects. Uh, and the second layer of challenges relates to governance challenges. A lot of these projects uh, may not have a governance or have a governance that is related uh, and primarily focused on the project creator as an organization uh, or the project backer. Uh, some of the challenges are related to the projects being originally uh, proprietary uh, internal efforts that were created as a specific uh, need for a certain product. And they were open source from there to benefit from the network uh, ecosystem uh, that the open source uh, offer. Uh, and other um, challenges within that ecosystem is that as the project grows, it becomes really hard for a number of companies to figure out you know, who's going to manage the trademark, who's going to own the website, uh, who's going to provide the IT services, who's going to support the marketing efforts. And putting all of these challenges together uh, poses kind of a glass ceiling uh, for project investment. So if you are a company that, that is looking to invest and adopt an open source project, 
Um, you would ideally prefer a project that has an open governance project um, that where the, all the IP assets are kind of in a safe haven, uh, a project that welcomes people and allows them to grow with the project versus participating in a project with a lot of question marks on whether your investment and you know in terms of resources uh, in the project will lead to you getting uh, uh, kind of a seat on the technical decision. And all of these challenges actually are what led to the creation of uh, LFAI uh, with the goal to harmonize that space and provide uh, an, a number of support elements for the general open source AI ecosystem. So I have this slides that relates to motivation for harmonization. So basically our efforts go into different directions. Uh, one of them is to provide integration and inter interoperability capability across the different projects. And we have a presentation coming up later on during this mini summit that will uh, target uh, and provide more details on this. Uh, as a member of different organization, uh, of course, we would like to provide greater efficiencies for our member. So we are a member of different organization and we support a number of projects used by our members, resulting in a lot of efficiencies across marketing, support, legal support, and many other areas, IT, infrastructure, and so on. And at the same time, we aim to unify guidance for our end users in terms of interoperability, in terms of integration efforts, standard, and what the future lies for AI, data, and analytics as these technologies are being adopted uh, virtually by every single industry out there. Uh, and of course, from a hosting perspective, hosting projects under a single umbrella allows uh, really uh, a tighter um, amount of collaboration across these projects, across the communities, as they use the same services, as uh, we bring them together uh, across various committees to collaborate and uh, provide basically integration points and provide uh, APIs across and towards each other. Um, so uh, from a structure perspective, LFAI follows basically the kind of the template structure for any other umbrella foundation. Uh, so you can see there on the screen, on the left-hand side, you have the governing body. Um, it's called governing board, which is basically the funding governance. This is where members become, uh, companies become members of the LFAI and they provide funding for the organization. And under that governing board, we have a number of committees. We have the outreach committee uh, focused on communication, PR, marketing, uh, event support, and so on. We have the legal committee. We have strategy committee and a budget committee. Um, the technical coordination happens and is driven by the Technical Advisory Council, TAC. And actually, later on today, we have a presentation from Jim Sporer, uh, who is the chair of the TAC. Um, and the TAC, in my opinion, is extremely important in any kind of uh, foundational effort. LFAI is an example, uh, as this is where uh, all core technical efforts are being driven. Uh, under the TAC, we have the ML workflow and interoperability effort and the trusted AI effort, and both of them would be covered in a coming up uh, presentation um, after, right after this presentation. Uh, so the TAC Technical Advisory Council is the council uh, that is, represents our member and is responsible for coordination across all the projects, responsible for inviting and accepting or voting in projects to become incubated projects in the foundation and also responsible for promoting a project uh, from incubation into graduation. So it's an extremely important uh, body uh, that functions and, and drives LFAI forward. And on the right-hand side, we have the hosted projects. So today we have 16 hosted projects. Uh, three of them uh, on the top level are um, graduate projects, Onyx, Angel, and Acumus. And we have a number of projects that are incubation so now not all of them are on the slide because some of them are not announced yet. Uh, so if you uh, follow us on our LFAI blog, available from lfai.foundation slash blog, you will be able to find and be updated on new announcements uh, of in relation to incoming projects. Uh, so this is basically the basic structure and there is a complete separation between the funding governance or the governance of the foundation and the uh, governance of the project. So you can see there are a number of projects on the slide. Each of them have their own governance uh, and each of them decides how to operate and how to manage themselves, completely separate from one, the other projects, and of course the 
uh, management and, and the governance of the foundation itself. So projects are completely independent from that perspective, uh, and there's a complete separation between the project and the operation of the foundation. Um, in terms of uh, details on the governance, um, um, so basically the charter is available online. This is just a pointer slide. Uh, you can visit lfai.foundation and download the charter and review it at your own time. Uh, in terms of dedicated staff, uh, Jacqueline Serafin is the lead uh, project manager. Myself, I'm the executive director. And you have a number of staff that support us in terms of creative work, uh, in terms of IT, in terms of legal support, uh, and many other services uh, that are basically in support of the foundation and all the efforts uh, that we undertake. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we have a number of efforts ongoing. Um, this is basically the uh, major areas. So providing a neutral environment for our projects. Uh, this is one, we are vendor neutral, we are not for profit. We host, we provide open and fair governance, not just for the foundation, but also for the projects. Um, in terms of harmonization and interoperability, we have an effort in that space uh, to ensure interoperability and create integration points across the project that we host, but also between the projects that we host and other projects used by our members. Uh, we have a major effort uh, on trusted AI, um, and uh, I will not really uh, talk much on this topic because we have specific presentation on this. Uh, we've recently welcomed three new projects from IBM uh, to be hosted under the LFAI that are in the trusted and responsible AI space. So we will have a speaker, Annie Mersinge, who will uh, cover this area in detail um, during this mini summit. Uh, we have an effort focused on data, models, and marketplace. So I kind of combined all these three together under one bucket just to make it easier to create the slide. And of course, we provide funding and we provide a number of efforts in terms of marketing and awareness in general uh, to support the projects, to support the uh, different events. Uh, unfortunately for this year, we moved into a virtual model, but in 2019, 2018, uh, we were holding events and summits uh, face to face. Um, and of course, we provide marketing services, project management services, event services, and all of that. Uh, so our goal is really to support our incubation projects, to drive them to graduation, and to have them widely adopted and to grow their uh, user base and culture. Uh, so you can see this is uh, the timeline of the foundation. Um, it's a short timeline, you know, a little less than two and a half years. And you can see almost every single month we have uh, major uh, events happening. Uh, even for June, uh, we for now, um, you can see um, a couple entries, but we actually welcome three new projects and we had another virtual event, but unfortunately it wasn't enough time to update the slide for this event. Uh, so this, this slide is also available from LFAI if you'd like to download it and use it for your own presentation. In terms of membership, uh, we started with 10 members that were the core members that launched LFAI as an effort. Uh, today we are at 24 slash 25 members and we have three tiers of membership. We have the premier tier, uh, which is uh, basically a membership level that provides you a board seat. We have the general level uh, of membership and we have what we call the associate member level which is uh, a free membership for universities, uh, not-for-profit organization, and research lab. So if you work with a university on R&D focused on open source, with open source AI, if you work for government labs, uh, if you work at a not-for-profit R&D organization, you are more than welcome to join us and, there are, uh, and become an associate member and have the same benefit as the general membership, but with uh, zero fees associated with that. Uh, so I mentioned it briefly earlier, the projects, uh, this might look redundant slide. So we have uh, two level of projects, the graduation project and incubation project. Most projects come into the foundation as an incubation project. Uh, the process is very simple. Uh, projects get uh, to speak and present to the technical advisory council. And then that committee votes the project into incubation. And then uh, we have milestones, we onboard the projects to become integrated with our services as a foundation and we support the project. And as they start meeting our graduation uh, criteria, which are published on our website, then uh, they go back to the TAC, do the presentation, validating that uh, they met the criteria to graduate and then they, they graduate. And then at that point, we make an announcement and then they become eligible for additional funding pending the board approval. 
Um, so uh, a lot of details is actually available on the website, uh, lfai.foundation. Uh, and the TAC, uh, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's an open committee. It's available for anyone to join and participate in it. Uh, you can actually attend all the bi-weekly calls. Uh, the, we, we conduct conference calling as similar to this one uh, every two weeks, and these are open to the public. Uh, and you're more than welcome to attend. There are uh, really extremely interesting presentations from um, different companies, from different speakers talking about different areas of open source AI. And these calls are typically booked four to six weeks in advance. So if you're interested to present and speak to our community uh, about an open source project in that space, in the open source AI space, or if you would like to propose a project to be incubated, uh, keep in mind the um, kind of the backlog that we're working with. Uh, and of course, the link is available for additional details. And uh, please feel free to connect with me directly uh, to discuss uh, further on this. Um, additional resources, I will skip this slide uh, for the purpose of time. Um, we have a lot of information available on lfai.foundation for details on what services we offer for our hosted project, how do we help them, and how the project lifecycle looks like when it's hosted in the foundation. One very interesting slide I would like to show you is who's hosting projects with us. So as I mentioned, we have uh, 16 hosted projects in LFAI today, and we're only about two and a half years old. And we have these companies, you know, from Amazon to Microsoft, IBM, Samsung, and we have giants really from China who are focused on AI uh, in terms of uh, Baidu, uh, Tencent, and ZTE, and others, and Zillas. Uh, so we have really a great set of companies um, who look at to LFAI uh, as an engine to help support the projects, to help grow the projects, to provide projects with an open governance that encourages other people to participate and contribute in the project uh, with, the, <clears throat> with the aim to grow a community, to grow an ecosystem. Uh, building ecosystems is extremely challenging. Uh, a single company cannot do it together, and this is why companies come uh, to the Linux Foundation, LFAI in this specific case, uh, and work with us uh, to provide different pieces of this ecosystem in different categories so that we can build and provide end-to-end -end solution uh, that are based on open source project. All of them are foundation-based project with an open governance, uh, with assets owned by the foundation and not tentatively and possibly used um, in the future against some of the users. Uh, and uh, further to that, um, we are not just working with uh, and collaborating with commercial companies. We have, uh, I, I believe, six or seven uh, nonprofit organizations who are members of the foundation, as well as universities. And the projects we host have really a large number of uh, contributors from different universities. And uh, on this slide, you can see the number of universities uh, and the caliber of the universities participating in our projects. So if you are a, a member of a university, whether you're a professor, graduate student, or a student, and uh, looking to, to get involved with that AI, uh, we have a whole category specifically designated uh, for such participants, and we certainly welcome your contributions to the foundation, to the various committees, and also to the technical projects uh, that we host. <clears throat> so coming to an end, uh, we have a number of uh, areas and, and channels that you can connect with LFAI. We're active on social media via Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, many of our mailing lists are actually open to the public. You don't have to be a member of LFAI to participate in. Uh, so you can participate in the Technical Advisory Council, all the meetings. You can participate in uh, and look up our events uh, calendaring and mailing list. You can participate in various mailing lists uh, you see on the, on, on the slide. And also we have a blog where you can follow up uh, on our news and uh, new projects coming in, projects being promoted to graduation and so on. Um, and uh, as a last slide, you can see on the slide uh, some pointers, uh, how you can reach us via email. You can see us, visit us on GitHub and so on. Um, so I'm almost exactly on time, 20 minutes. Uh, I thank you for participating in this virtual event, LFI Mini Summit. And uh, I would like to uh, pass uh, the slide to the next speaker, um, Jim Sporer, uh, who will be presenting uh, on the Technical Advisory Council from LFAI. And thank you very much. 
Great, thank you, Ibrahim. And thank you everyone for joining. Um, it's really a pleasure to present to you today and give you an update on the uh, Linux Foundation AI Technical Advisory Council. I'm Jim Spore from IBM. I was recently, this is an elected position. I was recently elected uh, to, to be this chairperson. Um, uh, Ofer Hermoni uh, 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 previously had been the Technical Advisory Committee Chair. And it's a great pleasure to be in the chair role. As uh, Ibrahim said, the TAC uh, calls happen bi-weekly. So every other week we have a TAC call. It's open um, to anyone with an interest in uh, open source uh, data and AI and analytics, as, uh, as Ibrahim said. Um, so I would just like to mention that, you know, in my day job, I'm the director of the Cognitive Open Tech Group at IBM. And that's uh, part of our developer ecosystem community. I'm based uh, in California at uh, the IBM Almaden Research Center. Uh, we also have our uh, Center for Open Source Data and AI uh, based at uh, Watson West in San Francisco. Um, and um, I've, uh, I'll make sure that uh, this portion of the slides are up on my slide share. Uh, please do feel free to reach out, contact me. Uh, with any questions that you have, and I'd be happy to uh, follow up. There's a lot of interest in, as Ibrahim said, in data and AI these days and enterprises. In fact, I can't think of a single enterprise that doesn't have some uh, interest in, in all of the advancements that are taking place. Um, so it's a great time to get involved, and I think joining uh, Linux Foundation AI TAC calls is, a, is really a fantastic way to start. Uh, building your network and, and getting engaged in this community. Um, this uh, slide is uh, not only Ibrahim's favorite slide that the Linux Foundation AI has created, but it's also my favorite. And I have to say it's also very popular with a number of our IBM executives and fellows. Um, you know, I think, you know, I just want to say, you know, everyone is welcome to these TAC calls and um, I imagine uh, if you uh, take a look at this Linux Foundation AI landscape, uh, there's probably some project in there that you or your organization is familiar with. And so there's a lot of touch points uh, possible. And, and what we try to do on the TAC call uh, is invite people who are engaged in specific projects to present about their projects, people with specific questions, use cases, all, all people are invited to these, uh, to these TAC calls, and I urge you and your colleagues to take a look at it. Um, we, of course, all agree to a, a code of conduct, and I've got some links. Again, I'll share these slides on my slide share, uh, links uh, that go out to our code of conduct in this uh, landscape. Um, so the next question is, uh, who is welcome to present at these bi-weekly TAC calls? Well, certainly people with an interest in the LFA landscape and LFAI community, um, but really we're looking for presentations about anything related to data and AI open source projects. And the landscape is huge, over 250 projects. And some examples of the TAC calls that we've had over the years, um, April 20th, 2018 was the founding members discussing all the processes and documents that there's multiple hyperlinks out there now for all of these. Um, there's a huge amount of work that went into Linux Foundation AI, making sure that it was um, had all sorts of uh, appropriate processes for onboarding projects, all the documentation, everything from the code of conduct to, um, you know, procedures for, um, helping projects move from an incubation level to a graduated level. And, and part of that graduating process is building a community of others around that project. And I think uh, Linux Foundation in general does it fantastic. And Linux Foundation AI is, is doing a great job as well. Uh, December 6, 2018, uh, Uber representatives pre presented Horovoid. And Horovoid is one of the uh, incubating projects in, in, in Linux Foundation AI. 
uh, January 3rd, 2019, Acumos and Angel project updates. These are other, these are graduated projects. Um, on April 25th, 2019, about a year ago, the ML Workflow Committee was established. That's one of the major uh, working groups within LFAI. 20th, 2019, a few months later, Trusted AI Committee was established. And Animesh Singh, my colleague from IBM, who's one of the co-chairs of the Trusted AI Committee, will be presenting next. On April 23rd, 2020, Red Hat presented about the Open Data Hub, gave us an introduction. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, 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 other uh, talks that we have on June 18th, 2020, uh, Montreal AI Ethics Institute presented about their organization. And I should say that presentation, which happened uh, relatively recently, there's a whole array of services. There's webinars, there's courses, there's uh, all kinds of activities that the Montreal AI Ethics Institute has that now our um, LFAI members are also starting to participate in as well. So as you can see, this is kind of a network of networks of uh, organizations and projects all around this theme of open source data and AI. Um, Next, I'd just like to say uh, a little bit about uh, who are the current voting members of the uh, TAC, of the uh, Technical Advisory Council. I've listed the organizations here and the names. And again, I will post this to my slide share because there's hyperlinks here that you may want to click and take a look at. Um, but uh, the uh, LFA, LFAI charter uh, talks about the Technical Advisory Council and its purpose is to facilitate communication and collaboration among the technical projects and also to build the community. And representatives of all of the premier uh, members and graduated projects get a vote. So this is an important point that I'd like to just mention. So um, not only are the TAC uh, uh, calls for uh, presentations and growing the community, but there's also work that gets done in, in a number of these uh, TAC calls, votes on which projects to admit to the Linux Foundation AI, uh, as Ibrahim said, typically in an incubation mode, uh, votes on when a project is ready to be graduated, um, and uh, other activities that require voting. So all of the premier members uh, are able to assign a representative, a voting member, as well as all of the graduated projects. And you can see the names here. Um, the benefits of uh, having a project in the Linux Foundation AI, Ibrahim also went over this, but I think it's important enough to, uh, to emphasize and repeat. It's really this multi-vendor open governance of assets owned by a nonprofit foundation. Uh, there are a lot of open source uh, AI and data projects out there that are uh, primarily controlled by a single vendor. And that does introduce risk if other organizations wanna build a product on top of that, it still is a uh, single vendor controlled. So when a project comes into the Linux Foundation AI, and it's under true multi-vendor open governance, that takes a lot of the risk out, uh, competitive and concerns and risks that an organization might have. So again, um, uh, we would welcome you to these TAC calls and we would also welcome your organization to become a member of Linux Foundation AI. And if you have a project, if you're a developer working on a project, we would. We would welcome learning more about your projects and, and possibly having it join Linux Foundation AI to help build the community around the project. Um, moving along, uh, this is uh, the call to action slide that I've prepared. Um, and I'll go through each of these uh, briefly. I, I talk to a lot of people every day about open source data and AI. And as Ibrahim mentioned, I typically start with the Linux Foundation AI landscape and I find out which category of open source data and AI are they interested in. And then we drill into the specific projects in the landscape um, and find out you know, 
what is their organization or what are they as an independent developer doing? And, and as Ibrahim also mentioned, this, this landscape is growing. It's, it's not static. It's, there's new projects being added. Um, with over, you know, 250 projects, I think the, um, it's, it's, it's an enormous, uh, effort to, to keep the top projects being included in the landscape. And, and each, if you go to the landscape, uh, each, project has a card and you can get additional information about it. So, so I really urge you to, if you are a developer, if you are an enterprise developer and you haven't seen the Linux Foundation AI landscape, please just go out to it, study it and, and get back to us and suggest additional projects if you see something that we're missing. Uh, although it is pretty comprehensive, I have to say recently inside of IBM, I showed it to one of our IBM fellows who's working on IBM's AI strategy, and he was just blown away by it. He said, this is, uh, this is an awesome, incredible uh, service that Linux Foundation AI has provided to, to all enterprises to be able to see this comprehensive list of open source projects. The next thing I would ask you to do is to um, study the Linux Foundation AI technical projects and use these projects and contribute to these projects. Again, these uh, projects are under multi-vendor open governance. They are welcoming. They have an established code of conduct for helping people who uh, may have a lot of experience, may not have a lot of experience, but there's, there's ways we can bring people into these communities to allow them to make contributions. So that would be the second call to action. Uh, the third call to action is if, um, since we have had these TAC uh, meetings for uh, a couple years now, uh, you might want to just go back and review the recordings of previous TAC meetings to get a sense of, you know, what happens in the meetings. Maybe look at a meeting where a project was voted on to become incubation or graduation or or a, a new project was proposed or a new member presented about their organization. Go in and look at these recordings. And uh, after you do that, the, you could suggest future topics for us to consider. Uh, next, you know, join the weekly TAC calls. They're Thursday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. <clears throat> Actually, today we had canceled the TAC call uh, because we have this mini summit, but I decided just uh, because it was on my calendar and, and somebody might not have had the news to go ahead and start it up. So I started the Zoom and six other people joined. And they said, yeah, we, we knew it was canceled, but we were just double checking. And, and we had a fantastic conversation about Acumos and one of the general members just launched a new AI project. We had a conversation about that. Uh, a person from uh, uh, Accenture in India who joined, uh, gave us some pointers on some stuff they're doing. So again, it's a very, very welcoming community. We have a lot of people who have a great interest in open source data and AI, uh, very welcoming. So please uh, consider joining these weekly, uh, bi-weekly, I shouldn't say bi-weekly, they are not weekly, TAC calls Thursday, 9 a.m. Introduce yourself into the chat. And we also have an LFAI Slack workspace. Uh, please feel free to join that. Uh, final, uh, Call to action is a uh, request that your organization uh, join LFAI. And uh, uh, if your organization, like many, is uh, expanding what it's doing in this AI and data space, it's a great thing for uh, your strategy, your product development teams, your research teams uh, to consider uh, becoming a part of uh, LFAI. Um, and just... Uh, Briefly, I want to, uh, you know, the other thing that we do on these TAC calls is there's uh, uh, legal notices. Um, it's a very, very well-run nonprofit. It's, uh, you know, in my mind, Linux Foundation is the benchmark organization for uh, uh, proper behavior. All of the antitrust issues and policies are there. It's, it's your, your, your enterprise legal organization would find uh, Linux Foundation AI is best of breed uh, in terms of open governance of projects. So please, again, uh, you know, consider becoming involved. 
And now I would like to um, hand off to my colleague, Animesh Singh, to present about the Trusted AI Committee. Animesh, over to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I think uh, both Ibrahim and Jim, you know, covered uh, very nicely in terms of, you know, the landscape of the overall LFAI and the role of TAC in it, right? And I think as one of the things which you probably saw on that LFAI landscape was essentially, you know, the projects which are grouped there, they're grouped in certain areas. And, you know, it was probably harder to look at from a screen perspective, but one of the areas there is, you know, trusted AI. And I think this is something which all the enterprises, all the organizations which are now implementing AI are, you know, grappling with, right? So we are in a phase uh, with AI where essentially, uh, you know, more and more models are being deployed in production. I think more enterprises now have the skill set, the technologies and the infrastructure to move, you know, more models in production. Now, as these more models are moving in production, uh, what they are doing is they're also making critical decisions, right? Decisions whether you are getting admitted to a university, decisions like, you know, whether your resume actually gets to the hiring manager, decisions in some cases like, you know, what should be your criminal uh, sentence for an offense, they play major role in life altering decisions. And because so much responsibility is being entrusted to AI, the other side of the coin, which is essentially that, you know, AI itself should be responsible and it's making critical decisions. There should be trust and transparency is becoming a critical theme, right? So a lot of it is coming, you know, organically from within organizations who definitely, you know, want to do it the right way, want to be on the right side of history, but also a lot of this is being enforced by, you know, uh, different regulations within each of these industries, right? where there are audit regulators, et cetera, who are looking now at models, trying to understand models, their predictions, individual predictions, as well as predictions over a period of time <clears throat> to make sure, you know, what they are predicting can be trusted. Uh, they are doing it responsibly and in an ethical way. And I think we, when we look at the current time we are in, right, where we are, uh, you know, from the perspective of when we have a global pandemic going on, then we have, you know, a lot of protests here for inequality related measures. You will, one, you know, quick Google search will probably show you, you know, there is a lot of call now happening. And more importantly that, you know, in these times, in these unprecedented times, right, having responsible, trusted and ethical AI becomes all the more important, right? Things like, you know, um, you talk about, you know, hospitals, for example, you know, running to capacity, right? How are patients getting admitted? Are they, you know, being treated in a fair manner? A lot of these things, you know, which are happening at this current point in time, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, unfortunately, you know, job losses happening, right? And then a lot of people are in the job market, they will be reapplying, right? Ensuring that, you know, the, the resume is uh, being accepted, being sorted through, uh, through these AI systems are being done in an uh, unbiased and fair manner. You know, a lot of these use cases are coming, you know, to the forefront and we have to ensure that as we go through this, we do it the right way. And also, you know, as part of it, right, we end up on the right side of the history. Now, one of the things, right, when we talk about, you know, uh, ending up on the right side of the history, I think, uh, just last month, right, our CEO, uh, IBM Zervind Krishna, he essentially, you know, uh, sent a letter to the Congress uh, opting out of, you know, a, uh, any facial recognition technology business in which IBM is involved in, right? And I think that also set a good precedent, you know, pretty much after that, we, we had a lot of other major companies, you know, doing their own announcements on similar lines. Uh, but it also, you know, beyond just the fact that, you know, we are opting out of that particular business, there was, you know, much more details where uh, Arvind actually invoked, you know, a lot of IBM's history and how, you know, we have been making conscious efforts in terms of, you know, building products which can be trusted and responsible and ensuring, you know, throughout our legacy uh, that what we are building, uh, you know, can be 
uh, ethical and trusted. Uh, I mean, if if you probably follow this landscape, right? One of the things which IBM is definitely known for is you know security, and we ensure that you know that is one of the themes in you know a lot of the other work which we do as well. Uh, another important factor to consider is that you know the impact is not only immediate it's not only tactical it's not only within the current context right if a lot of the human biases right and we all have biases and and you know uh, that's part of the human nature right and obviously as a society we are all improving but you know if these things bake and get baked into the ai layers of today right the bottom layers you're probably looking at you know the next generation ai systems for the next decade using those base layers which have you know bias uh, etc uh, you know baked into the base layers and then you know they are making decisions for the next generation for the next decade for example right which are not being done in an ethical way and and as i mentioned beyond the tactical impact of it the larger impact is that you know it can set the society as a whole generations behind right as you can see right i mean there are a lot of voices which are coming in the community right if we don't do this ethically and in inclusive way right a lot of the gains for example what we made in civil rights and gender equity right uh, might be wiped out because you know uh, ai systems are not doing or not giving predictions or not making decisions in the right way. Now, one of the things, right, we at IBM did uh, early on, I would say, you know, around a couple of years ago, this is something uh, which we started doing more in the open, but even before that, right, IBM Research invested uh, before, you know, uh, the trusted and responsible AI became a major theme. Around three years ago, IBM Research, you know, started investing a lot of efforts in terms of creating uh, technologies, you know, filing research papers, uh, filing patents, how can we ensure that, you know, the AI systems which we are building, you know, uh, can be done in a more trusted and responsible way, right? And as part of that effort, you know, there were four principles which were identified, like A, we want AI systems to be robust, right? Because again, carrying forward the legacy of security which we have, that was a primary theme uh, that thou shall not be able to, you know, um, fool AI systems, right? So they should be uh, not vulnerable to adversarial attacks, right? Because you know models are getting deployed, a lot of inputs are coming in, and even though those inputs, you know, can be modified, and those modifications are not perceptible to a human, AI systems can be fooled to give vastly different prediction than what they are supposed to give. And there are a lot of cases, right, which we have seen in in the robotics industry, in the financial industry, where um, adversarially generated inputs which are being sent to AI models, right? They are actually, you know, forcing models to make predictions which are vastly different uh, than what they were supposed to do, right? So one of the tools which we launched, right? Can anybody tamper with it? With that notion, uh, we call adversarial robustness 360. Uh, that essentially, you know, focuses on this particular part of the landscape, which is, you know, uh, it allows you to, uh, analyze your existing uh, models, both deep learning as well as machine learning models, right, uh, across TensorFlow, PyTorch, scikit-learn, and XPend, right, uh, the different frameworks you use uh, to analyze whether, you know, they are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. And if it does find that they are vulnerable to adversarial attacks, it gives you uh, algorithms to defend against those attacks, right, which you can implement in your AI models. Uh, so, you know, pretty strong tool in that side. Uh, we also, you know, got funding from uh, DARPA, uh, which is, you know, the U.S. Defense uh, Research Organization to actually uh, co-create and, you know, uh, this along with them as we move forward, right? So they are investing quite a bit in terms of taking uh, some of the technologies being built as part of this project uh, into the defense research mechanisms. The second uh, tool, and I think, you know, the topic which is very very topical uh, is around you know fairness uh, are your models biased are your data sets biased if they are biased how can we measure bias right how can we detect bias uh, if we can detect bias then how can we mitigate bias right so you want to look at it from the whole life cycle perspective starting from uh, data processing right so you want to be able to point your data sets and even you know starting from that perspective 
is my data set biased itself, right? Versus, so you know, the uh, distribution of the different features and the samples is a particular um, feature overrepresented or underrepresented because a lot of the real world data sets you will get, for example, you know, let's take an example of a criminal uh, justice system data set, right? You will probably see, you know, it's, it's very, very biased because a lot of the data there is, you know, against a particular race. Um, and, and because that's a historical data, the models which are learning over that data, they are also, you know, showing more inclination uh, to be biased towards that, right? So those are the kind of things, you know, this tool actually allows you to detect. So not only in your data set, but also what we call, you know, in processing. So in your algorithms for the models, and also what we call post-processing, which is essentially, you know, once your models are deployed and giving predictions, you shall be able to use this tool to actually collect those predictions and look at it from a transaction perspective or over a period of time is the model, you know, giving biased predictions. So that's what we call AI Fairness 360. The GitHub links as well as, you know, the demo websites are listed there. And I think uh, one which is easily understandable and probably, you know, the most widely at this point being used is explainability. Now, a lot of the frameworks like TensorFlow, etc., they are coming with, up with their own explainability modules as well. What this tool does is, you know, also gives you explainability from, you know, a much wider perspective. Now, one thing which you do note is 360 uh, in all these names, and that's there for a reason, right? So we're not looking at, you know, just for example, your model is giving predictions. Is this predict? Can you explain that prediction? So that's definitely a class of explanations, which is very important. Okay, you denied my loan. You denied my admission. Explain why you did that. But I think what is also important is, you know, generating explanation on your data sets, on your features and samples, generating explanations overall, you know, the life cycle of your model predictions, right? So a lot of these models which you get are probably black box models. You know, they either have deep learning, a neural network code, a code, you know, which is not easily decipherable. So how you can actually <clears throat> have explanations generated for those black box models. And also, you know, uh, for example, you know, there are algorithms where you can have a surrogate model, which is looking at the explanations, you know, transaction by transaction basis learning and creating, you know, another model, which is, you know, for generating explanations for your original model. So a lot of these tools and algorithms are within the AI Explainability 360. Uh, one of the things which is also there is, you know, an integration with Line and Shap, which are, again, you know, very popular uh, open source explainability uh, toolkits. Uh, so both of them are integrated and exposed as part of the Explainability 360 as well. And, you know, apart from quite a bit of algorithms, which IBM Research has built into it, which look at the whole landscape, uh, from data all the way to your deployed models. <clears throat> and last but not the least, I think uh, another uh, project which, you know, we have launched uh, quite a bit of, uh, there are quite a bit of research papers. There is a website and, you know, this is something which we don't have the code yet, but this is around, you know, lineage and accountability. So essentially having the notion of uh, creating fact sheets, right? So when you're deploying your model, right, there is a fact sheet which essentially traces back and lists in very much detail, you know, what ingredients were used, for example, to make this model, right? What was the data set? How was it, you know, um, changed? You know, how were the features and the samples uh, manipulated, if anything? What version of a framework you use for training? What hyperparameters you use for training? You know, when you actually tested, what was the testing data distribution set? So you can, you know, trace back the whole lineage of this, and that's where, you know, fact sheets play a role. Now, one of the things which we did in the context of, uh, you know, LFAI was also, you know, uh, joining hands and forming this trusted AI committee, because, you know, I think we definitely realized and, I, and, and you know, uh, Linux Foundation also realizes and Ibrahim has been, you know, uh, very, very uh, keen on ensuring that, you know, this is an effort which LFAI, uh, you know, launches uh, from the ground and ensures that, you know, beyond the core, there are a lot of things which go into, you know, policies, regulations, social science, et cetera, which play a role in creating the next generation AI systems, right, which are unbiased, ethical, responsible, transparent. And that cannot be handled by code itself, right? I think definitely you need to have code and a lot of the on-ground practical things will happen with code. And that's where, you know, the open source projects play a role. 
But uh, the second aspect is also, you know, looking at the general industry use cases, right? Uh, what is what are the use cases, for example, in the financial industry or the healthcare industry or in the telco industry? And then also looking at, you know, the technologies backing those use cases. Now, the other aspect of it is, you know, the principles, right? If I, as an organization, want to declare that, you know, whatever AI systems and products and models I am building and deploying in production, they are trusted and they can be trusted. They are responsible. What are the principles guiding us, right? So as I mentioned in the beginning, there are four principles which IBM defined <coughs> for ourselves. So one of the activities, right, which this um, uh, committee also drives is essentially, you know, uh, coming up with a point of view of inclusive LFAI principles, which is a representation of the companies which are participating in it, you know, so the likes of, you know, Tencent, uh, Orange, uh, at and for example, you know, uh, Montreal uh, AI Institute of Ethical AI, Ethical ML Institute. So a lot of the organizations, you know, which are participating in it and ensuring and creating a collective inclusive set of principles, right, which can guide the overall technology landscape and use cases landscape as we move forward with it. Right. So I'm, as I mentioned, right, I'm one of the co-chairs uh, for North America. We have Swad Wally. Uh, she is from Orange, right? She is uh, uh, representing the Europe side. And then we have Jeff Call, who is representing, you know, Asia. And he works for Tencent organization. And I think one of the things, right, which we also did, um, and probably, you know, one of the first uh, activities which the Trusted AI Committee uh, sort of helped uh, the LFAI landscape was, you know, looking at the projects which are playing into this space, right? So what are the projects into the explainability space? What are the projects in the bias and fairness space? You know, uh, what are the projects which are, you know, playing into the adversarial uh, space and enlisting them there, right? So, for example, if a lot of you are using TensorFlow, you are probably aware of TensorFlow Cleverhans, right, which plays into uh, the space of adversarial AI so that, you know, you can uh, essentially uh, detect whether your models are uh, vulnerable to adversarial attacks. Now, as I mentioned, right, the one of the focus on our side has been to actually go very broad in terms of both the life cycle of AI, but also the number of frameworks we can support, right? So uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, uh, but there are a lot of these projects which are already there. Uh, if you look at the explainability space, there is, you know, um, University of Washington's uh, Lime and Sharp, right? They're they're pretty popular, heavily used, and you do get a lot uh, of heavy, you know, usefulness out of it when you're actually looking at contextual uh, predictions uh, for local transactions, right? So, again, I mean, uh, you know, this this landscape is ripe. And a lot of the worthy projects exist. So we definitely invite you and want you, you know, if you are building the next generation AI systems um, and now your organization is at a point where you are, you know, either rolling them in production or you probably have deployed already, you know, a few of these uh, models in production, right? You want to ensure that, you know, you are using these tools and technologies to make sure that, you know, uh, what you're deploying is, is doing the work, is doing in a responsible fashion. The other thing, right, uh, in general, so some of the samples of the activities, right, which we have been doing uh, into this work group, right? So, for example, when we looked at these tools, right, uh, AI Fairness 360 or Adversarial Robustness, one of the things we did notice was that, you know, this is a toolkit, right, which has a lot of Python libraries, which is very popular with, you know, uh, the data scientists who typically interact with Python, right, but there is, uh, a huge landscape of developers who are, you know, building platforms, right? So essentially, uh, you're building platforms for your end users to use it and to be consumed inside platforms so that these can be offered as a service, you need more than, you know, a Python library. And, and for that, you know, a lot of the work efforts we are driving has been uh, around a section which we call MLOps, right? So a couple of things which are happening there, right? We are creating, uh, uh, integration with some of the pipelines, right, which is uh, sort of becoming, you know, uh, one of the defining technologies for handling MLOps. So if you are aware of Apache and NiFi, right, very popular project into the data and AI pipeline space, um, Actumo's project, right, which is part of LFAI uses that. So we created, for example, a NiFi processor for AI Fairness 360. So if as part of your lifecycle, you need 
uh, bias detection and mitigation capabilities, you can use AI for NS360 i5 processor. Similarly, a lot of the open source community, right, is using Q4 and Q4 pipelines. They have become very popular, right? So another thing which we uh, integrated there, for example, was, you know, creating Q4 pipeline components for these. Then, you know, there are a lot of other presentations which have been happening around AI fact sheets or, you know, how we are integrating with, you know, model serving platform like KF Serving. Uh, we have other members like KPMG who are actually uh, doing this in practice in the field with clients and customers, a lot of the government agencies and cities as well as financial customers, right? So they came and gave a presentation and I'll have a few more details in the next of the slides. So a lot of these things are coming. On the other hand, under the principles working group, um, there is a lot of effort, as I mentioned, right, to get together, you know, with the participating companies, right, the likes of Orange, Tencent, uh, AD&T, et cetera, IBM coming together and, you know, the rest of the participating companies like Ethical ML Institute and creating a set of guiding principles, right, which can guide the next generation of technologies they will put behind to ensure that, you know, all those principles are getting addressed into the AI systems they are building. Right. So as I mentioned, you know, some of the activities in the technical working group, right. So one of the presentations which we had, for example, was around, you know, how to use um, the Apache and AI Fairness 360 preprocessor. And we also had, you know, presentations around how you can leverage uh, fairness and robustness into your Q4 pipelines if you're leveraging them. Then, uh, you know, there have been presentations around the work, some of the work which other parts of uh, IBM has been doing around making AFNS 360 compatible with the scikit-learn community or with the R. So there was a version of AFNS 360 which was launched for R users uh, to be used within that particular community. And definitely, you know, very recent one around AI fact sheets. Now, one of the things which I mentioned was for a lot of these te techniques to work, right, if you're not looking at, you know, just individual model predictions right so for example okay your model gives a response you can explain that within the context of that particular response your model gives a result and then you can you know there is probably you can use some trivial algorithms you know which we which we enable as well right to detect within the context of that but what you want essentially is over a period of time right you want to be able to have a capability to actually collect the payload Right, so the model request and responses over a period of time. And unless you do that, you would not be able to, you know, leverage some of the more advanced algorithms, which can then define as a whole, uh, you know, over the course of last six months and thousand predictions, your model has been biased. It has been, you know, vulnerable to adversarial attacks. There has been, you know, uh, outliers. There have been drifts. So if you want to be able to monitor all those capabilities to ensure that, you know, your AI system is working in a responsible and trusted manner, you need to collect those logs, right? So one of the technologies, you know, as part of the work which we have been doing is essentially uh, ensuring that we are uh, creating, for example, you know, payload logging so that we can collect payload logs when your models are deployed in prediction. And for this right now, we are using, you know, a project in Kubeflow called KF Survey. So essentially the idea is that, you know, as your models are running in production and requests are coming for predictions, right, we are collecting those payload logs over a period of time. We actually use, you know, uh, standardized eventing using cloud events to enable that. If you need more details, you know, definitely reach me out. And then I talked about, you know, the principles working group, right? So the team has come up with, um, you know, set of uh, seven principles uh, which are being used to uh, guide this at this particular point in time, equitability, reproducibility, transparency, governance, privacy, security, and accountability. There is, you know, uh, quite a bit of details behind it, but the goal, <clears throat> Here is that as we go through this and mature and we will publish, you know, an LFAI white paper, right? What does the LFAI participating set of companies think are the set of principles you should follow, but also implement it within LFAI. So not only, you know, a paper exercise, but we want to ensure that, you know, the projects which will be uh, going through different phases in the LFAI life cycle. So, you know, your project is getting accepted. It's being put in an incubation mode. It's being graduated. We want to ensure that, you know, there are some uh, processes in place uh, which can also give, you know, badges of honor and certifications that, yes, your project, AI project is following these principles, right? And, and it can be certified or, you know, um, there is some sort of mechanism, right, which we integrate into that, right? So those are the things which are being worked on uh, as part of the principles working group. 
So I talked about, you know, KPMG. Right, so they have developed, for example, if somebody is looking at, you know, how to do it more practically in the field. So they have developed their own, own framework called, you know, AI in control, where they essentially go through, you know, these different phases, strategy, design, model, evaluate, deploy, and evolve. And they bring a set of toolkits, right? Uh, so they bring, you know, a lot of these open source projects, which I talked about. They also use, for example, you know, what's an open scale as uh, one of the technologies, but there is a bag of toolkits, which essentially goes in the auditability process, right? So a lot of the companies which want to run an audit check, a governance check before they actually deploy models in production, right? They will leverage, for example, a service like this, right? And then ensure that, you know, the models are cleared after that auditability and governance process. Now, some of the use cases, for example, you know, they have been uh, seeing is, you know, spread across industries, as I was mentioning, right, you know, banks, credit card companies, uh, for example, you know, Amsterdam and Netherlands, right, is, is one of the cities they are working with to ensure that the complaint system, right, which is essentially open for the residents of that particular city, it's not being biased in terms of addressing complaints or prioritizing them. Right. There are, you know, uh, even use cases which uh, they are handling in the travel agency because a lot of the times, right, you have uh, buildings, et cetera, uh, going on uh, where, you know, a lot of the bots are getting involved and they are actually, you know, uh, ensuring uh, that, you know, uh, they're taking away the right set of capabilities from, you know, owners or, you know, individual people who should be, you know, bidding on those or, you know, buying those. So, a lot of these scams are going on. So a lot of the use cases, if you see, they are uh, addressing are spread across industries, right? In the brewery company, in European uh, capital city, uh, travel agency, banks. So, and the use cases are emerging. Like one of the you know, use cases we are working heavily, for example, is uh, with, you know, one of the major retailers in United States, right? Which is using some of these technologies to ensure that, you know, uh, their hiring practices, et cetera, right, are right. So a lot of the work, you know, being done in the industry around this. Now, what sort of presentations, like for example, you know, some of our participating uh, member companies are presenting. So Orange, for example, did a presentation for Responsible AI and how they are approaching uh, Responsible AI within uh, Orange, how they are, you know, defining the set of principles and guidelines. And one of the things which, you know, is also guiding them is the European Union, uh, you know, so, uh, European Union has published a white paper, right, where they're essentially listing down the European Union's view of what a trusted and ethical AI should be. And there is a lot of chatter, right, that just like GDPR, right, which essentially laid down some ground rules and laws and, and guidelines where systems have to be compliant to GDPR, right, if you are holding, you know, sensitive data, uh, you need to pass that compliance. <clears throat> there is, you know, um, possibility, right, and, and, and discussions, right, which keep on happening that, you know, similar regulations will be coming around AI, right, to ensure that, you know, if you're using AI models, you know, uh, they can be trusted, they can, they are responsible, there is transparency, and how do you prove that they are doing that? Now, one of the things, right, which I talked about was, right, uh, essentially, you know, we have a quite a bit of open source projects in this space, right, which we uh, leverage both within the trusted AI committee, right, but also IBM, uh, you know, leverages quite a bit of the advanced algorithms from these projects and some of the products which we use with our uh, financial and industry and banking partners. But just having code into open source is not enough, right? I think both uh, Ibrahim and Jim stressed on it, right, that a lot of the projects there are they are in open source right but they are typically you know in a lot of cases run by a single individual or controlled by a single vendor and probably you know closed in their governance right uh, they are at times you know delaying or not allowing outside contributions or in some cases right you know outside leadership uh, to actually you know uh, gain prominence within those communities right so i think they pose a lot of a greater risk and lower that opportunity for collaboration and innovation right uh, so that's where, you know, IBM has um, diligently followed that model that with the projects which we work in open source, whether it's our own projects or the projects, right, uh, which are coming from other major, major organizations, we want to ensure as much as possible that they are in an open governance model, right? So which means, you know, they are 
in a foundation in a neutral place. So that means, you know, there is the neutral uh, organization which is holding the copyrights and the associated trademarks, right? So that reduces the risk of project abandonment, right? Fosters a lot of coll uh, collaboration, eliminates that single vendor control and risk associated with that, right? And gives a very um, real sense of ownership for all the collaborating members. So I think since this is a principle which we at IBM follow and we want other projects to follow, uh, it's, you know, all the more makes sense that we do it ourselves, right? So as part of that, you know, our VP of open source, Todd Moore, just this week at Open Source North America, right, he announced that we are moving uh, all these projects uh, into LFAI in an open governance and neutral model, right? And part of this is to ensure that, you know, all the things which we uh, talked about, what being in a neutral place brings about, and we want to make sure that given the current times, right, uh, the unprecedented times we are in, and the heightened need for ensuring that, you know, the AI systems are being built in a trusted, responsible, and reliable manner, these projects should be, you know, leveraged by the community. They should be owned by the community and collaboratively uh, developed by the community, right? So that's um, essentially, you know, the announcement which we did that we will be, you know, moving these projects into an open governance model to LFAI. The LFAI tag a um, couple of weeks ago, right, voted for these projects uh, to be moved in. So uh, we are working through the processes to ensure that, you know, they will be uh, getting onboarded uh, within the LFAI committee. With that, I come to the end of my presentation, right? So I do want to walk you, uh, uh, or you know, have you walk back to five key things. A, we have you know projects which are now part of LFAI, right? Which are into this space and addressing it from multiple perspectives, right? From security and vulnerability and adversarial attacks, from model explainability to you know projects which are looking at you know. Uh, bias and ethics problems in your models, detecting, mitigating, giving you a lot of tools and technologies for that. Uh, we also, beyond the code, right, as I mentioned, right, we cannot just solve it by code. Uh, and, and beyond the code, there is a lot more which needs to happen, right, along with the code. And, and that's where, you know, the LFAI Trusted AI Committee largely plays in, right? So we definitely do a lot of technical and hands-on use cases, but we also ensure that, you know, there is this larger uh, view which is being taken into uh, from a uh, regulatory, from social science, and coming together as a collective view of the participating companies and the set of principles being defined. And the last thing, right, I mean, if you are interested into this research area, this is a very active research area, right, a lot of papers being published. IBM Research has done an excellent job of putting up a website where they are you know, publishing uh, the latest set of papers, etc., which we, they are you know, uh, putting out in this space. So. You know, if your interest lies in that space, I will encourage you to look at that. With that, I will pass on to Jim uh, to talk about, you know, the next, uh, which is the ML Interop Committee. Uh, over to you, Jim. Great. Thank you, Animesh. And um, I just want to uh, thank Animesh for going deep into the Trusted AI Committee. As I mentioned, uh, there's also another committee, uh, the ML Workflow and Interop Committee. Uh, Howard Huang from Huawei is the uh, uh, chair of this particular uh, uh, committee, Linux Foundation AI Committee. Unfortunately, he suffered bandwidth issues this morning and wasn't able to join. I, I have to empathize because uh, in these pandemic times, if our internet goes down, it's, uh, it creates chaos. And I remember two days when my family and I had no internet and it was, uh, it was tough going for a while. So um, uh, Howard runs a monthly uh, committee meeting and you're welcome to join that. I would uh, just mention again that the TAC uh, committee calls are every Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, Animesh, uh, those are every other week for the TAC calls. The alternate weeks that we don't have a TAC call, Animesh runs a trusted AI committee uh, call, I think one hour later uh, at um, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Howard runs uh, calls as well uh, once a month for the, uh, for the ML uh, workflow. 
And what this committee does is, as you recall in the landscape, there's a huge number of open projects and ensuring that they interoperate and work together is, is the focus of this committee. And uh, so I invite you to join this committee as well if you have an interest. Um, this uh, basically, I'll go through this pretty quickly to leave some time for q and I want to try to leave at least 15 minutes. So I'll try to go through these uh, slides that Howard prepared for his ML Workflow and Interop Committee in about five minutes. But the ML Workflow and Interop Committee is addressing all these interop issues. Um, there's a, a, a slide here that just talks about a recent development of the Pyro project, which became incubation level in Linux Foundation AI and Julia and MindScore. There's work to, to get these uh, working together. Uh, and um, uh, I'll just uh, move on quickly because I want to cover a lot of ground. Um, let's see, this is the scope of the uh, ML workflow and interop committee. And uh, Howard likes to use the term northbound interoperability and southbound interoperability. And northbound is when uh, AI native programming frameworks are adopted for an application in different areas. So the northbound is kind of, you can think of it as the application level riding on top of, of many of the open source projects. Uh, southbound interoperability when the AI native programming frameworks is used in various compute and storage backends. So that's the infrastructure level. So uh, Howard is very interested in uh, ML workflows and interoperability, both northbound at the use case application level and at the southbound uh, infrastructure level. We look at the various frameworks for interoperability. Onyx is a graduated project of the uh, Linux Foundation AI and has a, uh, a semantic graph representation, uh, both for TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Scikit-Learn, uh, lots of other ML and DL frameworks um, uh, can be converted into Onyx. And then once it's in Onyx, of course, it can be optimized for different hardware. Uh, it can run on different platforms. And uh, many different tools use Onyx as the, uh, uh, for interoperability. And uh, for example, MathWorks. And Onyx as a graduated project also has community meetings open to the public. The last one, I think there were um, uh, 200 people registered, 100 different organizations uh, from representing 100 different organizations. So, um, and again, uh, another aspect of the problem scope is building interoperability when various types of deployment could be uh, reproducible on different pipelines. Of course, this is uh, the Kubeflow project is, is not part of Linux Foundation AI, but it is on our Linux Foundation AI landscape. And uh, many of the members of Linux Foundation AI, including Animesh Singh, are committers on the Kubeflow project. So we have a lot of connections with, with projects that are in, in the, um, uh, in, the uh, in the LFAI landscape. And I do encourage you, uh, if you are listening and participating in the call today, uh, you can put questions in the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Um, moving right along, the next thing beyond the scope that we wanted to uh, briefly touch on, uh, this is a diagram that shows a little bit more about what's meant by the northbound app application areas. You can see computer vision as an application area, natural language processing, reinforcement learning, lots of different application areas on the AI native programming. Um, and then down below in the southbound, you can see the interop on various uh, various types of uh, hardware, uh, clouds, edge devices of that nature. Um, so this slide here uh, talks a little bit about the committee, um, the goal of you know, we have a standard set of questions we ask. We try to identify the gaps uh, that exist to uh, make projects interoperate. We sometimes invite projects to the uh, these uh, monthly calls and ask, you know, which can, which projects are you uh, able to interoperate with well and why, and which projects are you not able to interoperate well uh, with and why. 
and then we go through uh, an exercise on each project, uh, getting a cross community discussions going, looking at what the gaps are, trying to figure out how do we create an interop specification, and then develop joint proofs of concept, uh, both where we see uh, opportunities to connect projects, as well as where we see difficulties in connecting projects. I should just briefly mention that Ofer Hermoni, who was the uh, previous chat chairperson, was the person who helped launch this uh, ML workflow group and was the chair before Howard. Uh, the ML workflow interrupt committee update, uh, these are some of the you know key developments and key stats. Again, I want to leave a little bit of time for Q&A, uh, hopefully, or, or just discussion between Ibrahim and Amish and I to reinforce any messages that the three of us might want to reinforce. So I'll skip through these pretty quickly, but there's lots of ways to uh, get involved and um, please reach out to Howard or any of us if you'd like to get involved. Um, we have been going through the various uh, projects like Adlik, Selden Kubeflow, Onyx, talking about uh, uh, these five different types of questions that we try to address for each project. Um, this is some of the outcomes from the Adlik discussion. Again, I'm not going to go through these in detail. We do publish all of these minutes from the community calls, so all of this is available online. A lot of it's in the Slack channels that we have. Um, and uh, with that, I think we can open it up for discussion with Ibrahim, Animesh, and myself. And if anyone with questions would like to submit them, we will try to answer those questions. And if not, I've got some questions for Ibrahim and Animesh, and we could uh, have a good discussion just off my questions. <laughs> So, great. I'll ask um, Ibrahim a question while we get started. <laughs> so, Ibrahim, why do, uh, could you just go over again why organizations find it useful to be uh, part of Linux Foundation AI? Um, thank you, Jim. Um, I was not expecting the questions to come from you, so that's good, though. <laughs> um, so there, there are really a number. Of, there are really a number of motivational um, pursuits, you know, for companies why they would want to become part of the LFAI. Um, there's there are companies that would join uh, to support the foundation because they believe in the efforts we're doing in terms of building uh, and enabling that open source AI ecosystem. And we'd like to fund off funding to enable our efforts, whether it's legal efforts, um, supporting infrastructure for projects, uh, marketing efforts for projects, uh, event, bringing communities together and so on. And also there are projects that join us to uh, help their projects by bringing their project to the foundation and becoming uh, members basically to, to have a seat on the table in that sense and help grow their project within the foundation. Although it's not, not a requirement, but it, we, all, we always love to see a company hosting projects with us um, become a member as well. And there are uh, kind of a third type of companies or organizations that join from a kind of a pure um, R&D perspective. Uh, these are a lot of the associate members uh, that are universities, research centers, and other nonprofits uh, who have some overlapping interest with a lot of the efforts we do, and they see it best to become a member so that they can participate more actively uh, in the different committees um, and, um, and efforts that we have. Um, and of course, uh, being on the mailing list and having access to the event, free access to the events and so on. So, um, so I think every company is different. But basically, the, the common theme is participation um, and collaboration under a neutral uh, foundation. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ibrahim. And I do want to remind people that there is a Slack channel. I think it's called number, number sign 2-track-ai-ml-dl, so track AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, number two, where uh, 
that Slack channel is open for questions and discussions as well. So I'll just remind people of that. Um, question for Animesh <laughs> while we wait for a question. Um, Animesh, you had a slide in there about open governance. Um, I know, you know, part of the reason IBM is interested in this space is all our products are based on open source. I think, uh, you know, 90 percent of the capabilities in our products are, are based on open source. And I know IBM considers it important not just to use the open source, but give back. Um, could you say a little bit more about um, uh, the what you see as the value of open governance? Just briefly. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, as I highlighted there, right, I mean, it, it works at so many levels, right? I mean, open source, projects, uh, you know, by virtue of it, if you look at the really successful open source projects, right, they grow because, you know, there are volunteers, there is a community which is organically formed, right? I mean, obviously there are organizational investments, right, which strategically drive, but any open source project which you look at, which has become hugely popular like Kubernetes, et cetera, over a period of time, you know, the organizational interests are surpassed by you know a lot of volunteers who come in and form this huge community uh, to contribute and grow. Now, if you look at from their perspective, and we have you know seen this again and again, you know a lot of our open source contributors and developers they tend to stay back and stop contributing to certain projects because you know the governance is not right. Where essentially you know the the amount of efforts they are investing, right? And obviously it's evident to everyone else around them, people who are contributing to that project, that they should have, you know, a leadership position there, or they should have, you know, uh, more rights in terms of committeeship, uh, maintenance ship, right? They're not getting that, right? And because there are some vested, uh, you know, organizational interests which want to control the project in a particular way where, you know, the voting structure, the, the ownership is, is skewed. So you tend to lose a lot of those, you know, organic developers, very good developers, right? And and the communities get start getting, you know, stifled. Uh, people get frustrated. They move from a project, and you know, they just in some cases leave the organizations because if the organizational mandate is you continue contributing, but they're not seeing that personal gain uh, coming through that. So I think that's one of the key reasons. If you want your project to be truly successful and organically being driven by Developers who are coming, who are excited, but also, you know, they are, uh, the projects are ensuring that, you know, you are getting uh, uh, efforts and you're getting recognized for the efforts you're putting in. It's very, very critical to have the right governance. And one thing which totally makes this possible is, you know, having the project in an open governance model with a neutral IP, with a foundation, right? I mean, we have seen the huge success with the projects which are in Apache or the projects, right, which are in Linux Foundation. Anybody who follows the CNCF landscape, he can, I mean, we see, you know, the huge proliferation of the community which happened once Kubernetes moved into CNCF, right, and made Kubernetes what it is today, right? So I think that's that's why, you know, <clears throat> this is something, you know, which is essentially very, very important. But beyond that, even as an organization, if I'm looking at, right, beyond the individual developer perspective, if I, as an organization, I'm going to invest create roadmap for my products to be based on these open source projects. I need to ensure that <clears throat> there are no legal concerns around IP. There are no legal concerns around, you know, trademarks. Um, you know, suddenly someone cannot change the license of the project unilaterally, cannot change the name or the logos and the trademarks. These are the things, right, which, which people who are investing and productizing and now deploying it in customer uh, and your enterprises want to ensure uh, are you know robust and sound. So that's again you know, their project being in an open governance model in a foundation you know really really helps. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. I, okay. So I think that brings us to the formal end. I don't know Ibrahim uh, or Animesh if you have any <clears throat> last words or anything else. No thanks. If I think not, so. I think uh, I think. Sorry. Go ahead, Ibrahim. Go ahead, Ibrahim. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, as the last word, I would like to invite people attending this uh, seminar, this mini mini summit, to really visit lfai.foundation website. Um, we expect 
people to visit us just because they're interested and, and would like to learn more. Uh, and I think to kind of go a little further on that, to consider uh, two things. Number one, uh, joining us as a member. Uh, as you mentioned, Jim, earlier, it's really hard to find a company that is not interested in AI and specifically open source AI. And we are working as a vehicle to accelerate innovation in the space. And number two, I would recommend them to visit us uh, and read on <coughs> hosting project with us and success stories about are hosting with us and growing their communities and graduating uh, and so on. Uh, and all of that information is available on the website. And I'm also available for one-on-one -on -one discussions. People can reach me on my email address, my first name at clinicsfoundation.org. Uh, we can book time and discuss specifically um, any questions or inquiries about membership or project hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you Jim. Us to the end. <laughs> no, I think we're at the end. So thank you again, Anna Nash Ibrahim, and uh, everyone for participating. I think we'll call it a wrap. And thanks to the support staff as well for helping us thanks, put everyone. this show on. Much appreciated. Absolutely.